welcome back. It's been a while, uh, two weeks. Life's been really busy. Um, I got a YouTube comment from a uh, wonderful lady, Elaine Grasnow, who said uh, she wanted to see more uh, in-depth dives on specific plants I have planted. So ask and you shall receive. Let's go. First, we're going to head down to the stream. I haven't done an update on this willow. Look at these willows. I just love them. This willow wetland river project. It's coming along really nicely. This is kind of my insane polyculture bed set up. So we have scattered seeds of many, many different plants in here. I've talked about them before, but, you know, we got uh, blueberries growing right in around clovers, snails on them. Most people would freak out about snails in a garden, but if they have lots to eat, they tend to not go crazy. As you can see, like this is proof. The proof's in the pudding. Service berry trees. The whole bottom is strawberries. So there's strawberries right in here. And some things will live and some things will get outcompeted by others. strawberries but to me that looks like it's doing okay and we can always come in here and rip some clovers off feed the soil and every time I do that the mycorrhizal bacteria underneath the clovers and the roots let me pull one out it will die back and these little nodules here can I get it to focus? These little nodules here will get released into the soil. They'll get disassociated from the clover plant. And then it'll feed everything. Not a big flush of growth, but a slow timed, you know, a slow release growth. We've got has cap in here. There is, this is an insane polyculture bed, trying to kind of simulate uh, what Sepp Holzer does over in Austria, just throwing thousands of seeds and seeing what comes up. We've seen a ton of clover because there was a lot of digging. We've got milkweed. The clover did really well because we disturbed the soil and clover's a pioneer plant coming into to, uh, heal, the, heal the soil. We got some, some horsetail in here, which is a common weed, but to me, this is just a ground cover that's covering a bunch of stuff. It's not going to shade the ground out. I can always chop it and use it as green manure, but it's going to allow other seeds to germinate through the, you know, dappled sunlight. More blueberries. We're working the overstories to some service berries and some peaches. We've got our fig still doing well. Fig right there. That thing's going to die to the ground every year. You can see somewhere here, if I wanted to just grow strawberries, in this area it's a little more clear. For whatever reason, I'm not sure, stuff didn't pop up here. So there could be something going on here with the compost I brought in, the wood chips that I brought in, who knows. But the strawberries are doing well. If I just wanted a strawberry patch, I'd be best to just do this. And a strawberry here and bare soil and a strawberry there and bare soil. But if I want to maximize total carbon sequestration out of the system, then I don't do that. My goal isn't to maximize my strawberry yield per hectare. My goal is to maximize my carbon sequestration per hectare, my overall f food yield per hectare. So the system's doing really well, really, really well. I'm very pleased. We'll see how this thing evolves in the next couple of years. 
Here we have Achillea asiatica, mountain yarrow. It's a very, very valuable plant. Um, any plant that you see that has flowers shaped like this tend to be very, very good insect pollinator attractors. This is absolutely um, the case with mountain yarrow. It is also an antiseptic. Um, it is a coagulant, so it can help stop and clot blood flow, which can be used for, you know, for wounds. You should still dress them, you should still treat them, take them to the hospital, but um, if you're ever in a pinch, it's good to know. Menstrual issues, same thing, it's a blood clotter. It's, uh, I think I said antiseptic as well. It's an antiseptic and it's uh, also an anti-inflammatory. It's got a compound called, I believe it's called azuline in it. And it is uh, uh, anti-inflammatory. Great plant. You can also eat it. Um, one note with yarrow is uh, if you consume it or use it too often, you can actually develop photosensitivity uh, and rashing. Like Egyptian walking onions right next to it. So let's plant these. Um, so just be careful how you use it. Don't overuse it. It's a pretty good, pretty good uh, rule of thumb for most life, for everything in life, sorry, is just don't over consume it. If you have any concerns, don't use it. Just use it as a pollinator attractor. If you want to try it, try it in small bits. A little bit here, a little bit there. Try it and see how you feel. And if you have anything serious, don't be an idiot. Go get medical attention. And I know all medicine comes from drugs, but the side benefit you get of going for medical attention is additional additional eyes on you addressing your situation well-trained eyes that can adjust and adapt to other symptoms and signs that they're seeing so i'm going to throw that caution and anytime i talk about using something for medicine or consuming it you know I'd be very careful with this stuff but this is yarrow so this lower swale at the side of the house is my main wildlife entry my zone five, if you you know if you know permaculture zones, the untouched wilderness is right here. So I get deer coming right up here. You can see I let mullen go straight to seed. Love mullen. I talk about it in many videos actually. It's a great plant. Beautiful flowers, tons of seed, deep taproot. Drives a super deep taproot, just like comfrey. Dredges nutrients up from way, way, way down below where other plants are competing, brings it up into the leaves where I come along and rip them off. You can see the, the seeds, some of the seeds are in here. I don't know if I can focus on it. So I rip it around or along and then drop it down and then it feeds my raspberries. So all the nutrients that this thing's accumulating from way, way, way down where it's not competing with the raspberries. It brings it up, puts it in its leaves, and then I put it back on the top. So, And even if I don't do it, the plant's natural dieback will kind of do it. It'll take those nutrients from the leaves and put it back down into the root. But the root, it'll put it into kind of the feeder roots to push up for next year. This is another swale. So I have kind of three swales here. Well, and they're not really swales because they're not really trenches. They're actually more gardens on contour. These ones I didn't really dig a trench in because the catchment area is not that big. But I really did want to catch any rainfall that I could. So I just at least put them on contour. So I have this bed here that's currently very bacterial heavy. Lots of um, uh, shredded leaves on top of horse manure, on top of cardboard, on top of compost. So that's what this bed is here. So it's very bacterial heavy for probably another year or so. So I'm growing lots of, you know, green leafy veg and they're doing really well. A lot of that's Jerusalem artichoke, different herbs and flowers. There's daylilies in there and these hyssop. I'm growing my basil. 
And a tip for basil, I've talked about this maybe before in other videos, is that if you want lots of leaves, you've got to pick the flowers out. So all plants will grow a bunch of leaves. Oh my God, the smell coming off this thing is unbelievable. So wonderful. All plants will grow a whole bunch of leaves to maximize photosynthesis. And then they make a push and they decide when to do it based on the plant. In optimal conditions, they'll make a push and they'll push out genetics for next year. So when they do that, they flower and the plant uses all of its energy to push flowers out and then push, push seeds out. So if you want lots of leaves and your goal isn't to save a bunch of seed for the basil or whatever plant, then you pick the flower heads off and that'll trigger the plant to go, oh, I didn't do my job yet this year. I need to push more flowers out, more leaves, more seeds, but it'll have a flush of new vegetative growth when you do that. That's how you kind of keep it growing lots of Lots and lots of basil for pesto. And what an easy recipe basil and pesto is. Some oil, some pesto, pine nuts and Parmesan cheese. Smash it all up together in a mortar and pestle, you got pesto. I'll maybe do a video on our how I make my pesto another time. These Jerusalem artichokes are doing great. Let's get back to the, I got distracted, let's go back to the, to the swales. So back to this mullein and this lower soil. These soils here are a little older. I created these actually, and you can see evidence of it, two years ago, by dumping leaf bags. So these are people's old leaf bags. So I would dump the leaves here, throw a leaf bag down. Well, maybe throw it down further, dump the next leaves on top of that, throw the next bag down further, and keep going right across. So no shovels needed, no hard work, just picking up leaf bags on my way to the kids hockey. And then turning those leaves, other people's waste, into food and healthy, healthy soil. Planted this out to some bushes, some cherries. These here are hazelnuts. So hazelnuts wind pollinate kind of like corn, so you really want a bunch of hazelnuts together. So I have hazelnut here, this here is a, well, camera's a little slow, that there's a hazelnut, raspberry patch, and then you want nitrogen fixers in there as well. So I have sea berry right here, I got sea berry in there, you can see another sea berry here, right there. This big friend here is a cherry, and we have a cherry right in here and this guy through this wall of raspberries the deer find it so this is the only tree I get smashed by deer so you can see what my response was plant more thorny raspberries this thing I thought was dead hundred percent but I kept planting uh, sorry, I said thornless, I think. I planted thorned raspberries. These are wild raspberries that I found while hiking and planted these in here because I figured deer will hop a six-foot fence, but they may not want to wade into super thorny raspberry bush patch that's like eight foot, 10 feet, tw 15, 12 feet maybe wide. So for the most part, that tree is surviving this year, surprisingly. So this is how I kind of wall out deer. Now, the other thing that I did is I planted more Jerusalem artichokes down in the, in the valley there. So the deer love the Jerusalem artichokes. They eat the flowers. They just absolutely, it's like candy, like crack to the, to the deer. So they'll eat the Jerusalem artichokes. And then they'll enter into, and they love these... Um, the sumacs as well, the young sumacs. So I, I make sure that I coppice the sumacs to get lots of new, fresh, green vegetative growth for the deer. So you have to feed them because if you don't feed them, they're just going to push in and they're going to push their way in and eat. But if you feed them, you feed them the Jerusalem artichokes, you feed them the sumacs, and even 
they might nibble on the raspberries themselves because the raspberries are actually pretty good. But then they don't push into it. They don't jump into it. They don't leap into it. That's the idea. It seems to have worked really well this year. Like this cherry here. Let's walk around and see that cherry. On the way over, you can see that I also plant onion. These are perennial onions, Egyptian walking onions. I'm a big fan of these. You can eat the greens. They're wonderful. Really, really nice taste. Great in soup. So, so good. Got lamb's quarters growing here. I'll leave that up. So, lots of smell wall in here. And every single one of these canes, or I, that's probably not the right word for them, had little bulbits on top, and I just lined the whole bed. So, where all these lilies are, these are kind of an indicator of where I want the path to be. Where all these lilies are, there's onions, so they'll all be up. So this will be a, a lined row of onions. I'm hoping the deer will smell that, and they don't want to come in too, too close. And they'll just kind of leave the rest of this stuff alone. But let's talk about this cherry and the wildflower patch. So this cherry also is at the entrance of the, the deer. The deer come in on the bottom here. I have a river system down there, so they come in all on the river looking for, there's lots of nettles and stuff that they, they can browse on that's very healthy, and there's tons of little sapling trees that they like to eat. So they come up from there and wander a little too close to the house. So instead of putting fences there, I did the raspberry wall and planted Jerusalem artichokes for them. And then I also planted these cherry trees. In the first couple of years, they just decimated the cherry trees. But then I surrounded the cherry trees with these super heavy thorny sea buckthorn and the raspberries. And this tree got taken back every single year down to somewhere, let me see if I can find it. Well, pretty much to right here and here to right here, everything was gone. Absolutely everything. There wasn't a single branch left but I protected it a bit and it just needed a little bit, just needed a little bit of protection and it needed the soil to build a bit. You can see I have deep tap rooted um, Queen Anne's lace wildflowers growing all here as well. So these are really good at nutrient dredges as well. Cut those off, put it down and all that, all those roots will die back and feed the fruit tree. But this just needed just enough time to get up flush out a huge set of growth and push high. I think this tree is going to be immune to deer browse, especially if I go further and further and give the trees more late season apples. I have some wild apples down in there. I kind of can't see them from up here, but I graft my wild apples down there. And these are apples that I found on the way to work and I look in January, February for trees holding apples still. And I take cyan wood from that and I graft it onto those apple trees. So hopefully this year, maybe next year, I'll have very, very late season apples for the deer to still eat at my entry point into my food forest. And they'll leave the trees alone. But for now, this one should be good. The smaller guy, which is right in here, you can barely see them hiding in those raspberries. It's really hard to see. I always find that it's hard to see on my camera when I'm doing the videos, but then when I edit them later, I can see it. So you can kind of see in there the cherry hiding, trying to get up. So hopefully this year it'll be able to get up. But I've been also really working on my wildflower game, cranking up. You know, when you first start a food forest, you want food, you want fruit trees, you want to get all that going. But I've been really working on these wilder edges. This is, it moves into a bit of a shadier edge, so I'm not specifically planting this out with anything. With a crop that I need to, to, to bear yield. It's too close to the cedar wall that's to the south of it. Like that, it's a big wall. Sun's not getting through there. So this is a very shady spot. It's a low value spot for me. Um, my goal with this spot is to just transition this swale across. You can kind of see it in there. Just so that I at least capture 
the rainwater that wants to run off as it runs across my grass and it hits the swale and then it's on contour so it'll spread out and feed my whole system. Here we are inside the wildflower patch where I do grow some food. And we're gonna talk about this guy. This is Valerian. Valeriana. This is one you have to be careful with. Um, this is used as another pollinator attractor for me. You can see that similar shape. Very, very good at attracting pollinators. Uh, this is also a extremely powerful pain medicine plant. The roots of valerian, valerian root, is used um, for treating pain, fever, um, however, it is extremely addictive, so you use it in small quantities, and to be honest, I just don't use it for that, but it is handy to know what you can use on your property for if times ever get tough and medical help is not on the way. This can also be a hallucinogen, um, but it's also anti-spasmatic, so it can reduce spasms and treat extreme pain. Um, the list of things this thing does is so long that if I ever did want to use it, I would absolutely read on Plants for a Future and consult with it because there are lists and lists and lists of things this thing does. You know, well documented in medical research. So, this is just another plant that I said, oh, I'll pick one up at the uh, garden center because it was like a dollar at the very least it'll be a nice beneficial insect attractor and another plant for diversity but it's got these uses I know the warnings on not to use it um, or at least use it in a controlled way you can get addicted to um, the roots of this plant so I'll just be very careful with some of this stuff in fact my advice is don't use it that way use it just as pollinator attractor it's good to know though. Some interesting little friends. Making a conga line, hiding in the rain. You know, this is the fun to me out of a system like this, is seeing the life in the system. Everywhere you look, you know, there's little critters that are alive. It's really rewarding. So this plant here is actually a nice hyssop. It's known for attracting wildlife. It's very fragrant, great for pollinators. So it's great at entry points to food systems. Medicinally, um, you know, and I'm not a doctor, so, so uh, do whatever you want with your own health. But medicinally, the leaves are used um, as a cardiac and a diaphoretic. And you can make an infusion with the leaves to treat uh, fevers and colds. And then you can let that infusion cool and treat um, chest pain. Like where you've been coughing too much and you have you know, a, a chest muscle spasm. Now, my idea, you know, I'm very much a man of medicine, not of natural, natural past stuff. But all medicine comes from natural past stuff. And the more I use this stuff, the more I realize that, you know, some of the natural past, they, they're onto something. Because, you know, I've had colds and I've had mullein tea and it gets better instantly. I've had cuts and I put comfrey on it and it heals super fast. So if I ever tell you something can be used medicinally, use it at your own risk. Do some research. And when I say something treats chest pain, don't take that to mean I had a heart attack, so I'm going to go make an anise hyssop tea. Call 911, you know, and get a defib defibrillator to shock your heart back into pumping. Just use common sense. But a very valuable plant. 
And what better thing can we do for our food system than to accompany food crops with crops that attract bees, attract insect pollinators, um, beetles, wasps, flies, beneficial ones, provide habitat to predators. I mean, you can see this thing's loaded with insects, right? And then has other uses that you can use. Worst case, if I don't use this, every single year it'll still build soil. It'll fill in niches in and around the other plants that I plant. I'm going to transition this into a tree system, just not yet, because it's still too bacterial dominated soil for my liking. But these guys are helping with that. Mushrooms. So they're helping colonize and turn this soil into fungal dominated soil. But for now, I'm sticking with greens, tomatoes, Jerusalem artichokes, and East Hyssop, mulberry. And then I'll transition it into a tree system like this one. And I'll add some more flowers in, just random flowers, just for the sake of diversity. The wildflower packs that you get just have, you know, tons and tons of diverse different flowers, which diversity, for diversity's sake, is not a pursuit worth pursuing. However, when you do so hundreds and thousands of different plants, then what happens is actually nature sorts everything out because the plants that want to grow in these ideal conditions, they're the ones that are going to grow. So you don't have to sit there and micromanage everything. If you just over sow with diversity, then nature will grow what grows best. And the other seeds will still be there as a backup reservoir of seeds. And they will germinate as your system transitions. Some of the plants that I plant, they haven't come up yet. The seed is still viable, sitting in the soil, and it's just waiting for its time. So they'll come up. So this is the lower garden. Okay, yeah, this beast here is just finishing up life uh, for the season, so it's an awkward time to show it to you, but this is Levisticum officinalis, this is Garden Lovage. Um, it's another pollinator attractor. You can see, common theme. These shaped leaves are always, almost always pollinator attractors. Beautiful yellow flowers come from this thing. It really puts on a show. It's dying back now, so it's transitioning all this leafy growth you know, the leaves are dying back and it's putting that all back down into the roots for next season. In fact, I did a root cutting of this that might be more vegetative. Let's go look at that one. Yes, it's up too. It made it. So, here's baby lovage. Growing right in and around my kiwi, my grape, some comfrey. Another deep-rooted, deep tap-rooted nutrient accumulator build up that soil. You can see I, I do that all the time here. So the Lovage um, is a very savory garden or a salad addition for the leaves. It's edible. Um, it's got a, an interesting taste to it. Not a bad taste. It's just you wouldn't make a Lovage salad, but it has a unique flavor to it, which is a good complement to salads. Um, very good in soups. And um, according to my uh, Romanian co-worker, Chris, they use this um, in lamb dishes. It just pairs very well with lamb. So give that a try. Medicinally, it is... Uh, let me get back to you on that. Sorry about that. Not much traffic here, but when, when something drives by, it's big, so it's loud. Um, medicinally, uh, and again, at your own risk, I'm not a doctor... Um, this is anything you can think of with calming, this does. Uh, it, um, if you have uh, stomach pain, uh, it is an expectorant. So if you have, you know, digestion problems and you want to um, expel the bad stuff and get rid of it and flush yourself out, 
then you can go with a little bit more um, of this. Uh, you can make a tea of it. It's uh, touted to be good for colic in children. Um, obviously with young babies, you've got to be really careful of dosages and, and playing doctor. So uh, at your own risk with that as well. But it's supposed to be good for that. So just any time um, you have something going on where you want to calm it down, uh, you want to just kind of soothe it, relax it, uh, stomach pain, digestion problems, that sort of thing. You can see the polyculture gardens are coming along. These are gardens set up to try to mix and mash stuff together. Confused pollinators or confused pests, beans, tomatoes, zucchini, melon. Raspberry and corn, garlic, some things like to be pollinated in blocks like corn, so we try to plant little blocks of corn. And it's been a really, really weird summer, but everything's doing really well considering, especially compared to other people that I know around here. We've got some watermelon growing in our hugo culture bed. This bed is now uh, down to maybe a two feet tall, a foot tall. It's hard to see on camera. But when we put it in, it was six feet tall. And it just all compresses down. It's a wood core bed. And our goal is to build a fungal bed as a nursery stock growing bed for, for cuttings and uh, seedling fruit trees. So it's slowly converting to fungal dominated soil, but for now it's still fairly bacterial dominated with all the manure in it. So stuff like melons does well, turnips do well, radishes do well. Here's some some radishes going to seed so we just kind of take stuff and sprinkle it we already hauled a whole bunch of garlic out of here we got some grasses growing in got to pull those out and then we put some ornamental flowers in there as well some vines to kind of climb up it this bed will transition very very very, it'll be very, very different in a few years. Got some jewel weed in the back. Really good for if you have poison ivy. And we have poison ivy here, so we try to get the jewel weed growing wherever we can. I'm like six feet from them right now. It's kind of neat that they kind of trust me. Just the fact that I'm talking and he's not taking off. And I think the fact that he's cleaning himself is a good sign that he kind of trusts me because I don't think you'd clean yourself as an animal. You'd be like that, ready to take off. You're all right, buddy. And here we are at the raspberry patch and being nice to neighbor to nature gives you nice little gifts. See so all that fertility just so we can eat some little grass and some of the lower leaves of the raspberry plants. It pays to work with nature, not against it. Plus. I got to sit like a few feet from a wild animal. It's a bunny, but still, it's kind of cool. 
So thanks for watching. Uh, that was a bit of a deep dive into some of the more medicinal plants. I know I tend to talk about the food stuff more, uh, but the pollinator insect attractors, the beauty that the herbs and the uh, different flowers that I have planted bring to the system um, are really important. The diversity they bring, you know, different root zone depths, different uh, filling out spaces in between fruit, fruit trees. That's a super important. So uh, make sure you're planting lots of support plants, bring in those insect pollinators, look up what you can use the plants for. And again, use your head, go get medical attention if you need something. Don't try to cure cancer with, uh, you know, essential oils, okay? <laughs> For real um, this stuff is good to try if you have an upset stomach um, if you have a headache uh, but understand the plants that you're using so if you like this video and you want to see more in-depth uh, videos on uh, plants that I have planted non-food related more support species let me know and I'll do more of these videos uh, for now I'm gonna have a, a coffee and go enjoy the food forest peaches are coming see you next time